Hi, I'm Roland Turner, Chief Privacy Officer at Trustphere and part of the organising team for the FOSS Asia Annual Open Tech Summit here in Singapore. I'm going to talk to you today about use neutrality and its critical importance in the licensing of free and open source software. I'm going to cover three broad areas. Firstly, the objectives of licensing schemes, both FOSS and use discriminatory. Secondly, I'll argue that use discriminatory systems are both ineffective and harmful, and therefore a terrible idea, at least for OSI. And finally, I'll nonetheless explore what scope for cooperation might exist with use discriminatory communities for OSI. A bit of background, I think it's probably reasonable from time to time to revisit why we're here, where we came from, what we're trying to achieve. Additionally, in the last 12 months, there has once again been efforts to bring use discrimination into the OSI definition and OSI approved licenses, this time under the heading of so-called ethical licensing. I'm qualifying ethical for two reasons. One, the use of the adjective implies a, a binary characteristic, either a thing is ethical or it is not, that is not true, all ethical analysis lies on a spectrum. But secondly, that ethics starts from a selection of, of relevant values and these differ from person to person and perhaps more importantly from society to society. Consequently, licensing cannot even be considered ethical on a spectrum because it very much depends uh, who's looking at it and who's assessing it. A little bit about me, this is more about understanding my biases than, than any sort of um, authority claim. I've been reasoning and in some cases arguing in public about the application of free and open source licensing for a long time when Netscape held its consultation on the Mozilla public license for use for its initial release of the Mozilla browser back in 98. Uh, I argued at some length for the use of GNU GPL exclusively when it became quite clear that there were quite legitimate objectives of Netscape that were not compatible with GNU GPL. That was I who then proposed, inspired by Perl's licensing structure, the idea of multiple licensing of the Mozilla browser. And although this didn't happen immediately, a year later, was picked up by the Mozilla organization and gave rise to MPL 1.1 and its multi-license structure. In addition to being part of the FOSS Asia, Asia's organizing team for the summit here in Singapore, I'm also a frequent speaker and often on the underlying philosophy of free and open source software. And my work as a chief privacy officer and therefore as a data protection officer involves applying human rights directly to technological systems and to the processing of particularly personal data. This is GDPR, in, sorry, in uh, UDHR terms, this is articles 12 and 19. And finally, although I work with the law and where appropriate, I sort of request uh, formal sign-off by lawyers, I am not myself a lawyer. Obviously, you should not interpret anything in this as legal advice. I'd like to be clear about what argument I'm making, because there are some obvious uh, errors one might make, or obvious assumptions, incorrect assumptions one might make, given that I'm objecting to the embedding of UDHR in, in licenses. I support progressive initiatives in FOSS communities, in particular the successful implementation of codes of conduct for both online and uh, in-person interactions in many communities has been a great success. Yes, there are some abuses, but by and large it's been a success and has materially improved civility and therefore inclusiveness in free and open source communities over the last a decade and a bit, and I hope that continues. Uh, I clearly support the pursuit of UDHR objectives. It's a large part of what I do for a living. What I oppose is use discrimination in FOSS licenses. I'll start by briefly looking at licensing objectives. For free software, of course, Freedom Zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Uh, this is about as strong a statement of use neutrality as it's possible to, to give. Uh, and even the Free Software Foundation recognises the importance of this by giving it freedom number zero, in the same sense that in thermodynamics the law zero is the, the most fundamental law. And indeed in both cases it was that they sort of spill out other laws first and then realised, oh hey, there's this even more fundamental thing that we missed. There's not much point having freedoms to redistribute and to modify if you're not allowed to run the program in the first place. So it's, it's use neutrality is not just an interesting thing, it is the fundamental freedom for free software. Um, and indeed, this argument is made explicitly in the terms of rights and freedoms of human beings. Quote, the non-free program controls the users and the developer controls the program. This makes the program an instrument of unjust power. Note that the Free Software, Foundation, free software definition rather, is specifically about protecting users. It really is the, the rights and freedoms of human beings. Uh, I used even stronger language in the past, and then this was sort of upsetting to uh, corporate users, which gave rise to the open source initiative adopting instead the Debian Free Software Guidelines, almost word for word, there was, there was one immaterial change. And although m more than 
five of the, the ten uh, clauses of the definition uh, arguably some sort of use neutrality, it is uh, Article 6 that is clearest that prohibits discrimination against field of endeavour, which is you know, interpreted to mean against specific uses. Uh, the objective that the OSI definition, the OSI is pursuing is different. It's, quote, distributed peer review and transparency of process, higher quality, better reliability, greater flexibility, lower cost, and an end to predatory vendor lock-in, unquote. That, other, that last item is a bit like the, the unjust uh, instrument of power concerns of the free software definition, but it's as seen from corporate perspective, where you've got an organisation, you've got counsel who's accustomed to taking software on board under a licence and is, is also accustomed to being snookered by, uh, vent by software developers who have a predatory approach and are seeking to lock people in so they then have to buy their software in preference to, to competitors and are therefore under worse terms or worse pricing or what have you. The Open Source Initiative's objective is to facilitate collaboration, and particularly collaboration with, with direct competitors, people we don't like, people we despise. The Hippocratic Licence is perhaps the, the most visible example recently of the uh, efforts to bring use discrimination into free and open source licensing. Quote, it is the licence's express intent that all use of the software be consistent with the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, unquote, and the stated purpose includes, quote, specifically prohibits the use of the software to violate use universal standards of human rights, unquote. So not only is this clearly use discriminatory, it seeks to control users. This is diametrically opposed to the approach of the Free Software Foundation and therefore the Free Software Definition, which seeks to protect users. The Free Software Definition recognises that a power imbalance arises because of the you know, one program of rights and thousands of people use, and therefore seeks to progress human rights and freedoms by protecting those users. The Hippocratic Licence instead seeks to exploit that imbalance to control users, albeit for a higher purpose, maybe, and I'll get back to that. Finally, just as a data point, uh, this the Islam Copyright Public Licence is in such infrequent use that I couldn't even find it on a live website. I had to go and fish the text out of archive.org's Wayback Machine. This is a thing that I saw years ago but is no longer uh, publicly visible. It's only available in Arabic and of course, which I can't read, so there's unchecked machine translation, and in any event, requires an understanding of Islam, which I don't have. I merely wish to point out that the moment OSI begins to take on board the idea of allowing use-restrictive licenses, the, the scope of what it's taking on could be quite large and surprising. So, okay, it's not a surprise that a Islamic license prohibits um, any religious license, in fact, prohibits immorality and, and blasphemy, but of course those terms lack sufficient precision to allow a judge or arbiter to, to infer the intentions of both parties and therefore to enforce. But even on the positive or the more specific obligations, there are some surprises. Usury, gambling, um, interest-based banks, all well-known prohibitions of Islam. Insurance companies, bit of a surprise. It turns out that there is in fact a separate uh, approach to insurance which is consistent with Islamic principles. I didn't know that there was a surprise. Uh, factories and shops selling evils looks like a translation problem, but nonetheless points to a near certainty of the need for interpretation uh, in what it means. It's not a clearly stated uh, obligation or restriction. And finally, just in the how out of the field the surprises might be, and by this is dozens of, of restrictions, uh, announcements of praise and praise for the deceased, especially if he's not a Muslim. I accept that perhaps there is an Islamic prohibition on such a thing, it, it had not even occurred to me that there might be. So I, I'm not critiquing the license, it's not in use, it's not been put forward for OSI approval. I merely point out that the moment you head down the use discrimination path, you buy into some perhaps quite surprising outcomes, or worse, uh, the need to argue what is and isn't permissible in use restrictions within OSI's context, which I'd argue is, is in fact destructive. Uh, so the first major leg of my argument is that embedding EDHR is ineffective and that this arises because the people proposing it have profoundly misunderstood what UDHR is. It's a set of principles laid down in the wake of the largest genocide the world had ever seen, indeed larger than any that's happened since, a sort of reset of the relationship between the individual and the state. It was therefore intentionally aspirational. It's not a performance standard. It, quote, it shall strive, it talks of individuals and, and uh, institutions, 
state and, and private court shall strive to secure the, the recognition and observance of these rights. It was not ever a claim that there's a bunch of good countries or organizations that did this and, and that you know, this should be used as a position of, of moral superiority from which to critique bad people. It's here's where we would like to get to in our ideal world, but we're not there. No one is. There isn't a single country in the world that fully implements what UDHR sets out to do. And private sector organizations, you have a, a similar problem. The second part of the misunderstanding is just the sheer immensity, the sheer staggering immensity of what's involved in implementing human rights. I'd hazard a guess that there are several million people whose full-time work is implementing the rights spelled out in UDHR by work which in part implements Articles 12 and 19. is one little piece of this, but there's an enormous number of people worldwide doing this. The idea that you can sort of you know, tack UDHR into a license agreement or some other instrument and voila, you've made some material contribution to the well-being of human beings in the world is it's preposterous and it's, it's a little bit it's simplistic it's, it's sort of armchair activism you know, sitting back from a, a safe distance pontificating about what the right way for the for thing is and, and sort of telling others how it should be it's it's not reasonable it, it comes from or appears to me to come from serious ignorance about what's really involved in implementing human rights uh, and it also looks like that, that, that although UDHR has, that starts with the word universal it's not quite universal it's actually a very large identified minor, minority of people for whom it doesn't apply uh, I won't do the whole thing, there's 30 articles, but I'll touch on the two that touch my work. Article 12, which deals with interference in privacy, correspondence, honour, reputation, um, and 19, which is uh, seeking and imparting information, particularly with respect to, to politics. So that's about 73 words. To turn that into forcible law uh, took some time. So even though the processing of personal data was a significant factor, in the, uh, the Holocaust, this immense genocide, or set of genocides. Nonetheless, it was more than two decades before the first localized and sector-specific laws implementing this particular part of UDHR began to appear, in, particularly in states in the north of Germany, also interestingly for federal government in, in the US. Another 20-something years later, the first whole of economy, all activities, <laughs> footnote, except for law enforcement, which is dealt with separately. Uh, law appeared, this was the Data Protection Directive. Uh, that ran 12,000 words. So turning the 73 words in the, even part of them, because it doesn't cover the whole of political freedom, but the part of the 73 words in Articles 12 and 19 in UDHR into actionable law for an entire society requires an expansion of about 150 fold. And in fact, after 20 years of experience with that thing, the, the sort of refinement into the the more recent General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, it's five times as large again. We're getting close to a thousand times the size of the, the statement of principle. And so I point out that the gap between a statement of principle and some enforceable thing, law, contract or otherwise, is really, really, really big. The idea that you can embed UDHI into enforceable law or regulatory force or a contract or a license, if it's a naked license, uh, it doesn't, it just, it's not reasonable. Um, and this is sort of, sort of a, using the right tool for the job question. Human rights principles, enforceable legislation and jurisprudence, regulatory powers, and private sector contract license terms are four different things. Yes, they're all produced by lawyers in the same sense that programs are all produced by programmers, but you wouldn't expect to be able to take uh, you know, something out of a JavaScript uh, program and drop it into a Python program or a Haskell program or SQL code. Um, and expect it to work. The, these, the way you, although the same ideas and the same profession produces all of them, the details differ enormously. Perhaps it's true that the, these four things are closer together to each other than the four languages I just described, but nonetheless, it's simply not reasonable to attempt to sort of chop and change and, and just expect it to work. It, it generally doesn't. Uh, one of the arguments is that, but that, that, hey, hang on, you know, the fact that there's been decades of legislative progress, progress and jurisprudence takes away this uncertainty. No, it doesn't. Uh, certainly in the case of the Hippocratic License, it establishes a precedence that says you know, the most predictive rules win. Well, because UDHR is aspirational, then in almost all cases, it, it is the one that, that controls. And that therefore the fact that it gets played out in international laws in many different ways creates uncertainty. A judge or arbiter, before enforcing, must first discern the intentions of the parties. And when it's this woolly, 
that's not possible. A rational private contract or even naked license includes a specific testable set of restrictions and obligations by the, by the parties. The moment you diver, uh, diverge from that, you put yourself in a situation where an otherwise enforceable license becomes unenforceable, and worse, as I'll argue later, you create a tool for abuse with just legal costs. Uh, the other problem I mentioned earlier is that it's not quite universal, and this is a huge topic, so I'll touch it very briefly for time. The Cairo Declaration of Human Rights in Islam, whose signatories have within their borders approximately a quarter of the world's population, are disagreeing. They're putting forward a different uh, statement of, of rights that, that arises from Sharia. Uh, it is, according to, to reasonably capable experts, incompatible with EDHR in the areas of religious freedom, religious and sexual discrimination, and corporal punishment, for starters. What I would say here is, without getting into whether they're right or wrong, yes, I'm sort of Western Judeo-Christian tradition, the UHR seems to me to be a better starting point. However, that I think it's a good idea is not the same as thinking it's a bad idea for other people to have a different idea. And a quarter of the world's population, at least, arguably more, given that there are uh, large Muslim populations elsewhere, disagreeing means that the claim to universality is a bit thin. Uh, more relevant to this talk, however, is the Bangkok Declaration. The signatories to this declaration have within their borders just over half of the world's population. So arguably those who disagree with the Bangkok Declaration are in the minority. Um, and perhaps more importantly, a significant number of the signatories ha were in the past colonised by Western powers. And so they have a particular sensitivity to sort of self-righteous uh, moralizers telling them what to do. Uh, they emphasize a non-competitional approach. They discourage. I make pun. They open with a clear commitment to the principles. So this is not actually a lack of universality, but they're concerned about how they might be used. So they emphasize a non-competitional approach. They discourage any attempt to use human rights as a conditionality for extended development assistance, and then they emphasize the respect for national sovereignty. And so, the yes, the the, the experience of being colonized perhaps creates a, a much stronger sensitivity here to someone who accepts these principles and wants to grow into them, doesn't want outsiders pushing them to implement these things and thereby creating uh, resistance and actually worsening the progress of human rights. And so this is an important point to recognize that if you are sort of enabled by the, the rightness of your cause, if you, you know, march into foreign lands and start uh, exerting force to implement them, you risk not only not progressing your cause, but creating enough resistance to retard your cause. And this is a sort of a large part of the concern expressed um, in the Bangkok Declaration. I'd also point out the, and so this, this also applies directly to the ideas in licenses that, that incorporate compliance with UDHR as a condition. The conditionality is a problem because it's, it misunderstands that UDHR is something that you want to be an aspiration of the people, not a performance standard you wish to use to beat people over the head. Uh, it also fails to notice that the overwhelmingly the people whose human rights are in need of development are those in poorer countries who can't, and indeed in countries, to, to the Cairo Declaration for example, um, who are using free and open software because free and open source software because they can't afford to buy commercial software. The last thing we want to be doing is getting in the way of those people. The one other point I take out of the Bangkok Declaration is the observation that states have the primary responsibility for the promotion and protection of human rights. That is, the private sector organisations, although they have obligations, it is problematic for them to be trying to effect political change. Yes, it's normal in a number of Western countries, but in a large part of the world, it isn't, and it's actually harmful. It's actively harmful. And again, for this reason, having stuff embedded in private sector licences that tries to get in the way of, uh, or rather tries to push people towards a particular worldview is potentially problematic. And there's actually explicit guidance on this front from the UN, which I'll come to later in the talk. Having gotten past the uh, sort of profound misunderstandings, I'd argue that the largest single reason for stating that embedding UDHR in licenses is, is ineffective is that it's quite simply unlikely to stop the bad guys for a number of reasons. One is they're likely to be outside a jurisdiction where any of the developers have standing to bring action. Uh, another is that in many cases outsourcing neuters the license, and this is sort of why AGPL came about uh, because you know, cloud computing on the face of it allows invalidating. In many cases, rights of users are 
enjoy sovereign immunity and so they, they can't be touched by license, they, any form of uh, action about the breach of a, a license condition or a contract. And finally, <laughs> at worst, they've got fun. You know, we don't exist to look after the, the interests of programmers who happen to give us stuff for free, uh, rather than changing our behaviour, us being a sort of theoretical rights of the relation, we'll just pay for closed source. In reality, more likely they'll just use open source that doesn't have uh, UHR tacked onto the obligations. But this is what I'm saying here is that attaching UHR as a license condition is ineffective right up front, but it's unlikely to stop bad guys from doing bad things. There might be some other reasons that developers object, want to limit their software being used in situations that abuse human rights. But preventing the bad guys from using human rights almost certainly isn't uh, about how can you reasonably expect, and therefore probably shouldn't be used as the argument for this. It's also absurd. Uh, imagine a hardware store that uh, was willing to sell you screwdrivers and screws and nails and whatever, as long as you first entered into a binding contract uh, not to use these things to assemble terrorist weapons. Uh, quite obviously, the hardware store that did that would go out of business. Uh, likewise, a stationer that uh, required you to enter into a binding agreement not to use their pencils, the pencils you buy from them, to write terrorist manifestos. Uh, this also starts to get in the way of political, particip political participation rights that UDHR calls out. You, you, the idea that sort of putting license conditions into a, or use conditions into the sale of a thing or the licensing of a thing clearly creates some absurdities. And not just pencils, also things like you know, text editors and mail clients and mail servers. Um, you might, taking the thing to the extreme, perhaps a bookseller or a library who requires that their customers or, or readers enter into binding agreements not to use what they learn from reading these books. Uh, for aggression. George Orwell would be truly proud. So all this begs a question about where the line is. It seems that there's a thing where it's not okay that our stuff's being used for bad and yet I'm also arguing that it's not our problem because you know, otherwise it would be impossible to sell pencils. How do you reason about this? So helpfully the UN has published through its Office of the High Commission for Human Rights guidance on this exact question. I strongly recommend people who are concerned about this read this guide to help untangle in your head how to think about uh, human rights and you know, where responsibilities are and what where to engage and where not to. Uh, right off the top, in fact it's in the title page, I don't know if you can see it, but it's the idea of uh, protect, respect and, and correct or something. Um, right off the top, the, this guidance separates the human rights obligations for state versus private sector actors. In the state's case, it's to protect, that is to say, the state must intervene. In the private sector case, it's to respect. Self-appointed police officers you know, need not apply. This is about looking at or about ensuring that you're not sort of actively making the thing worse. But it's certainly not the case, and arguably not appropriate, for private sector actors to insert themselves in other places. Again, whether this is true varies from country to country, but as a sort of an attempt to identify universal uh, norms and in open source licensing, this is an appropriate question. Um, it is certainly not the case that private sector actors should, in general, be attempting to insert themselves uh, other than where they're directly involved. Um, I will skip lots of interesting detail because, again, we're out of time, but the, uh, importantly, this guidance talks about what appropriate action is. And I quote appropriate action will vary according to the impact of actors, the extent of actors' leverage in addressing the adverse impact leverage is considered to exist where the actor has the ability to effect change in the wrongful practices of an entity that causes a harm, unquote. So this is the test. And the reason that my sort of earlier point on you know, we can't stop the bad guys, well, generally we can't stop the bad guys, is relevant. If your proposed, proposed intervention does not have the ability to effect, to effect change, at least not materially, then it's not an appropriate action. It has it will do other harms. It may have other benefits, and one might argue about the desirability of the benefits, but certainly from the standpoint of promoting human rights, it's not an appropriate action if it doesn't have the ability to affect change. And I would argue that tacking UDHR onto license agreements really doesn't, other than in some really obscure corner cases. Certainly not enough to warrant changing the, the sort of basic framework. So how then to think about actions which have negligible le leverage. Those which have direct leverage, of course, you, are, you should be using. But what about where the direct leverage is negligible? And in particular, where there's a question about establishing norms. Maybe OSI has its ability. Certainly projects 
uh, developing license under software under OSI approved licenses do in some cases. So where that impact is negligible, there's a risk of empty virtue signaling or you know, lip service. The, the tendency to sort of talk about how excellent uh, someone or some organization is without actually lifting a finger to do anything to improve whatever it is that they're talking about, to sort of say, hey, we support human rights because we develop software with a with an ethical license on it, but not actually take any other action to uh, to achieve the improvement of human rights in the world. There's also a, a more serious risk that of dishonest signaling that you'll end up with, for example, greenwashing, where major polluters plant a few trees and claim to be you know, staunch defenders of the environment that they are destroying. However, yes, what if there is a potential for material impact on the establishment of norms? What to do then? And so the first thing is, okay, many human beings, most human beings, are motivated to do the right thing most of the time. Uh, but also more concretely, there's, you know, can, can we support progress? And so the answer to that would seem to be yes. You know, of course we should sort of tackle on UDHR obligations to free and open source licenses because that will support progress, or at worst, you know, help shift norms that will cause uh, progress elsewhere. Because hey, it costs us nothing, right? Well, no. no. Um, I will talk in particular about harm to FOSS, but it should be obvious that these harms actually apply much more broadly in many cases. Um, I will start right at home, Article 23, everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favourable conditions of work, and to protection against unemployment. A good fraction of the people watching this have earned some or all of their living in the last decade or two from either or both of automating things that used to take a lot of human work, thereby putting people out of work, or establishing gig work support structures for gig work economies which although they nominally help fix some of that problem have the net effect of eroding a great deal of the progress that was made in the in the protections of people who need to work for a living and therefore in the, the favorable conditions so on one telling the either the automation or the gig work uh, economy framework breach article 23 at least in the short term Hopefully we all believe that to the extent that we're doing these things that over the longer term, technological change gives rise to new demand and that the available supply of labor will adapt itself to that demand as has happened many times in the past. But certainly in the short term, there's, there's a strong argument to be made that Article 23 is being breached, at least some of the time. Uh, this gives rise to what I describe as the Cardinal Richelieu problem. This is the, uh, well, an abusive French preach, priest who was abusing uh, legal process to silence his enemies, quote, if you give me six lines written by the hand of the most honest of men, I will find something in them which will hang him. Also the consequences of capital punishment. The point being that once you tack UDHR on, almost anybody can be found to be in breach somewhere. And so this gives rise to a process abuse risk. We've seen occasional reports of this in the implementation of codes of conduct in free and open source communities, but I'd argue that it's the exception rather than the rule. Nonetheless, the, the motive is there. There's also the problem that, at least in the US, there's a much lower standard for civil than for criminal law. Uh, and so this gives rise to an abuse risk of the following type. Uh, and it applies to sort of both ends of most arguments. Let's look at abortion that uh, UDHR, in fact, is unclear on right to life, but how is that uh, apparent tension struck or addressed between the rights of the mother and the rights of a the federal rights of an unborn fetus. So, okay, uh, we have an activist, either an anti-abortion activist, looking at uh, trying to harm an abortion clinic, or a pro-choice activist looking to harm a, let's say, a church or other advocacy organization which is staunchly opposing abortion rights. In both cases, the activist, by whatever means, determines that the target organization is using some piece of software under a license which includes UDHR, that person then quietly joins the project that produces that bit of software, makes material contributions, hooray, thank you, waits until they have evidence the target organization is using those improvements or a version of the software that contains them, and then starts a legal process against them. And no matter how that plays out, the at the very least, there's an argument to be had and you've got to pay lawyers to, to win, uh, there's harm to be done. And so this is the the process of use risk, that by bringing in this sort of woolly set of principles, rather than a specific set of prohibitions and, and obligations, you put a weapon in the hands of dishonest abusers, masquerading as you know, activists to make the world a better place.
And so for that, uh, that reason alone, I would argue that attacking UDHR under free and open source licenses is a terrible idea. Uh, this is part of a broader idea that some writers describe as the outrage industrial complex. Uh, willfully creating drama is itself intentional harm. Uh, this has gotten so bad over the last decade that researchers are beginning to observe that whole populations are abandoning truth-directed methods of persuasion, rather relying on the identification of friend or foe, or broadly identity politics. Uh, this is bad generally. It's particularly destructive to FOSS communities for two reasons. One, we're engineers producing software. We have to deal with reality. We can't deal with just political expedience, because if we stick to the latter, we end up with software that simply doesn't work. But secondly, because we are so spread out and so diverse, bringing these fights into our forum will rip us apart in a much more serious way than is true for sort of closed source, typically commercial development communities. And so a really important idea here is that, that we all benefit from the work of people that we profoundly disagree with or even despise, and they from us. This is in fact the, the principal idea behind representative politics, that the representatives of a population elected ideally, uh, meet and sort of hammer out common ground despite people who otherwise disagree enormously about all kinds of things. An unreasonable approach to that situation is to seek to exclude those other people. A civilised approach is to seek to include them and find common ground. And I would argue that the idea of sort of UHR compliance as a licensing term is an example of the exclusion and trying to separate from these people that we disagree with or indeed despise rather than a more inclusive approach that I think most of us would see as appropriate and indeed that OSI was, was built to promote. Um, a smaller harm is license evaluation. This is a really important service that OSI performs because it's out of reach for most developers and because there's a benefit in a sort of small set of consensus licenses. Uh, so this is different to the problem about which uses you allow or disallow. A use description license from the outset is necessarily, sorry, evaluating it is necessarily use specific because OSI doesn't know what developers are doing, let alone what end users are using, it can't or doing, it can't give the same sort of comfort in decision making that the existing license evaluation process does. So whatever gains might be pursued by seeking use discriminatory licensing needs to be weighed against, amongst other things, destroying this or at least devaluing this most basic of things that OSI does. Uh, I've talked already about the oppression that having a license or capable of imposing their will upon another human being um, represents in particular doing so outside of imminent harm or political process. Because those, those are the perhaps exceptions in a civilized society where we say, okay, the state can do it, but there needs to be some sort of accountable political process. Individuals can do it in a sort of imminent harm situation to either protect uh, a person from an accident or indeed to prevent an aggressor from, from doing deliberate harm. But none of those applies to what's being proposed and therefore what's being proposed is in that sense oppressive. The real risk, of course, is that the organisations that people who wish to do this, wish to attach UHR to the licences, are trying to control, will just use purchase or commission proprietary software instead, or at the very least exclude uh, licences that include these kinds of terms, much as they are already doing with AGPL. And so as I deal with the privacy and security components of what my employer does, I do also get involved in licence terms that relate to uh, free and open source software, and I'm increasingly seeing organizations requiring blanket prohibitions on the use of software under AGPL because, of course, of the, the risk of someone abusing what the license is trying to achieve to create a process of abuse risk and that they can then nibble away with lawyers. And so in that respect, again, it's ineffective that the people that you are trying to control will simply not use uh, software that includes these obligations and will use something else instead. And more importantly, because, of course, most open source software that's in widespread use is developed by someone on the payroll of a corporation, in, in, often in work time, the, it also seriously harms the source of open source software. In fact, it's frequently overlooked. The free open source software, software is not actually about individual hobbyists doing stuff at all. The vast majority of it is now uh, written by and used by large corporations, and this is desirable. This, in fact, was the point of the founding of the OSI. So, the, again, the the drivers for embedding the DHR into licenses are contradictory to what OSI is trying to achieve. So, okay, if you accept my argument that it's ineffective and harmful, then job done, go home, right? Well, not so quickly. I believe that these are well-intentioned well attempts to impede. Earlier on, I had previously assumed that there was sort of conscious efforts towards the, the process abuse 
outcome. I'm now less convinced, but I accept that the intentions are good. Nonetheless, as it's unlikely to stop bad guys, it's harmful to foster communities. They're a really, it's a really bad idea. And I do wonder what interest is being pursued. And there is comment, I don't think I would claim that it's the, the sort of the true objective of the communities pursuing this, but it occasionally looks as though it's really about the developers' feelings and perhaps the reputations, then it is about the rights of human beings, particularly uh, oppressed and underrepresented minorities. And that, that's a rather unfortunate situation, if true. I, I, I can't argue that it's, that it's universally true, but that seems evidence to suggest that it's what's going on, at least in some cases. So, but okay, except all of that, you then left with a couple of perhaps underlying objections that are worth addressing at least briefly. Uh, one is the idea that the, whoops, hello, uh, that, that the developer wants to decide who gets to use their work. That's fine, this is Tobal's, you know, he who writes the, the code writes the rules. I'm not arguing that individual developers or indeed organizations should not do this. I'm arguing that OSI, should, that freedom resource software communities should not do it. So you're perfectly free to license on non-fosters as is, has always been the case. It's, it's, this is, I'm arguing specifically about the rationale and practice of cost licensing. Um, the other is this, but hey, we're responsible because someone used our thing to do, do bad things. Well, no, they didn't. Right? The, the, the screwdriver, the hardware salesman, the, the stationer salesman, the, the bookseller or the library are not responsible for what somebody did with their screwdrivers, pencils and books. But they're just not. Uh, there is the sort of shonky salesman's the, the con is you, know, you have to do something, this is something, you have to do this. The thinking is to get the, the customer slash mark so preoccupied with the, the awful problem that they need to do something that they sort of lack the resources to adequately evaluate the solution that's being proposed and therefore will sort of buy poorly, make a poor purchase decision on something that's either ineffective or, or actually harmful. Uh, broadly speaking, of course, this is the, the mechanism behind impulse activism, which is not helpful. It makes people feel good, it makes some organizations look good, but it doesn't do much to progress the, the rights of human beings in the world. So what this leaves is, you know, I, I don't like that bad people will do bad things with software that I have contributed to. And okay, sure, notice that this is quite explicitly about the feelings of developers. And again, it invites this interpretation that what's really going on is that developers' feelings are being put ahead of the rights and well-being of billions of people. So let us assume that that's not really the case. <laughs> that's not the reason we're doing this. That really this is just empty purchasing money. We'll, we'll tack, the, tack these terms on even though they're ineffective and maybe harmful because that makes us look good. Be looking after your own reputation rather than the harm that you claim you're talking about. Even that's pretty offensive. So okay, let's go one better and assume that actually you really do care about the rights of the people whose human rights are currently not being sort of well protected. Okay, what to do about that, if not license terms? This is the broad social control problem, and there are multiple levers available, and just examples include private contractor licensing, law regulation, a custom, in particular civility, is, is perhaps the largest uh, mechanism that societies use to ensure that their members respect each other, or respect each other's rights, property, and so on. Religion is surprisingly important, and not just, I'm not a religious man, but the it's not just the, you know, the be nice to each other, the basic idea is that your mum taught you as a child. Earlier this year, the Vatican put out the Rome call for ethics and AI, which is a specific actionable framework for use by developers preparing AI solutions to, to problems. It's, it's, there is real world space for religious organizations as sort of mediators and arbiters of, of ethical norms to act in this space rather than just saying, oh no, we, we sort of disclaim the importance of religion and we'll, we'll shove everything into, into our license terms. Uh, professional ethics turns out to be a huge one. Certainly I mentioned lawyers earlier, the idea that you only get to practice if you're a member in good standing of a professional body and the professional body has an interest in its own existence in ensuring that abusers get kicked out, of, either suspended or, or removed from the organization. And so the deal ends up being that society grants an otherwise objectionable monopoly in return for a good outcome. This applies to highly skilled professions where the clients must take an enormous risk on the honesty of the, the practitioner. So it doesn't apply to every field of endeavor, every field of work, but it does apply to a specific set of areas where professional ethics applies. And multiple areas of human rights are affected or improved by the existence of professional ethics. Uh, labor unions, entirely different mechanism, but have been a major force in progressing human rights for really a very large fraction of humanity over the last 100, 120 years. So there's, what I'm saying here is, 
don't don't get sort of hung up on this hammer that is open source licensing conditions and treat everything as a corresponding nail. There are many other tools available and, and frequently more appropriate tools. So expanding the earlier framework is how to think about actions with negligible direct leverage. That is to say, for example, tagging UDHR onto open source licenses and adding a cost dimension. And in particular, what happens when we recognize that there's a material cost? Hopefully I've just convinced you that that's true. If the impact on establishing norms remains negligible, then you're in the somewhat abusive situation where those who are promoting it are treating harm to existing values as an externality, not their problem. And respectfully, I would argue that this is in fact, or arguably what's happening with people who are trying to push use of restrictive licensing norms into open source licensing, because they've put, at best, the rights of human beings as being uh, and directly affected by our work as being a greater value than uh, use neutrality and then I've argued at some length as to why that's use neutrality is really really important and arguably as a community something we should treat as more important but let us suppose that the benefits of this indirect action the, the norms uh, establishing and strengthening norms uh, is something that we that we care about we face a dilemma either we decide that the, the loss Whilst the harms I've described are acceptable in return for this particular gain, clearly what is believed by those who are promoting it. Uh, and this is great, public demonstrations of commitment to limit free riders, unlike the lip service and greenwashing cases. But what happens if you conclude, as I have, that these harms are unacceptable? In that case, you perhaps look for ways to cooperate. So, okay, what are we going to cooperate with? So ethical source programs are being talked about. I would suggest that, amongst other things, this might include building a body of use restricted software and recruiting users and developers in the same ongoing cycles that exist in free and open source communities. Uh, it would seem obvious to seed with an existing body of open source software. Uh, it's too hard to repeat what Stallman did for the Gnome project, the, the writing of a compiler and an editor and a shell and a build system from scratch and getting to the point where they're still hosting on existing operating systems is something that very few human beings have ever done or will ever do, and is probably sort of unharmful overkill today. 20, 30 years ago, different story, but, but today, not, not reasonable. Fortunately, most open source software, most licenses, permit the addition of discriminatory restrictions downstream. The license, the resulting license is not called open source, but there's nothing stopping you taking something, particularly under the BSD licenses or the MIT license, and embedding them in a proprietary product. Usually, all, you gain, all you're left with is the obligation to make, to credit the source and include in copyright notices. So, the same thing could in principle be applied by a use restricted licensing program that is take a bunch of open source software tack on the additional notices and voila you've got a body of use restricted software it strikes me interesting that you can't do this with free software that a program purportedly pursuing the rights of improving the rights and freedoms of human beings is unable to reuse an existing body of software created by a program or a movement dedicated to protecting the rights and, human, rights and freedoms of human beings and has been doing so for decades. The food for thought. What does this mean for OSI? Uh, license approval seems very doubtful, although never say never. Uh, this, I've not given a, this is not an exhaustive treatment. There may be ways to address the concerns that I'm raising. Uh, affiliate membership is also problematic for the same reason. However, there is some compatibility in the goals and most of us, I think, would consider the goals desirable. Uh, if approaches were pursued to strengthening the support of human rights by free and open source software communities that did not involve use discrimination in licensing, then I'd suggest that the scope of affiliate membership uh, goes up fairly drastically. In any event, for the reasons I've just argued, there's a near certainty of a very large body of overlapping source code and therefore at least fitting in fixes and small improvements back, maybe dual licensing, don't know. Um, what I'm arguing is that although I oppose pretty strongly the idea of t tacking use restrictions into free and open source licenses. Nonetheless, OSI as an organization would benefit from remaining open to improvement, and so certainly engaging constructively with people whose motivations are good, even if we disagree with what they're proposing. I'll leave you with two closing thoughts. Uh, FOSS is both about protecting the rights and freedoms of users and about sustaining our ability to cooperate with people we don't like. That's free software in the first point and uh, open source software in the second. And that the, the freedom that people have to use, to modify, and to share the software that we write in any way that they wish has changed the world. We, we shouldn't be in a hurry to give this up.
um, I'll end there. Uh, this video and the slides are at that web page, and with luck, by the time you see this, perhaps a, a blog post expanding on some of these ideas. And in any event, if you're watching this live at the 2020 State of the Source Summit, uh, we should now be going straight into Q and A. Thank you. Okay, so we've got nothing in the uh, outstanding shared notes, apart from the fact that I've forgotten to push my uh, slides onto my website uh, prior to the session. Uh, so. Yeah, questions, comments. So, okay. Hello. Yeah, it's Mario here. So I got it at night. So to to chime in, yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, like, uh, uh, so so the motivation of many people to participate in the free and open source community. Um, like uh, it's often like they want to also improve the world. Of course, there is not just one motivation. There are many motivations. Like uh, you know, they're excited about technology. They want to build something nice. They want to be part of a community. Um, yeah, of course, like generate an income with what you do, but also um, the community um, to specifically do free and open source because they want to do something good and they want to be part of something good and they don't want to be, for example, taken advantage of and so on. So I think that seems to be the motivation with people um, who um, recommend like um, ethical license models um, and so on. So what do you think about this um, in, in the, um, like, in well, regards to the development of open source over many years? I think it's an important motivator uh, that uh, for for open source contributors, that what they are doing both makes the world a place, the world a better place, and indeed can be seen to make the the world a better place. I, I do object specifically to empty virtual signaling. There are, and as I made the point in the the sort of matrix of in the decision matrix, um, there are situations where the things that are a little bit light on direct effect nonetheless contribute materially to the formation of norms and uh, for that reason i think they're it's appropriate stuff to uh, to support and indeed the, the specific objective in the udhr case of course is one that i, I do for a living so I, I strongly support that um are you asking whether it's worth finding better ways to support human rights or other ways of improving the world and to do so visibly as a means of encouraging people to contribute to FOSS? Is that, is that the question you're getting at? Well, I'm, I'm just uh, trying also to understand uh, um, where is open source uh, heading. So we had, uh, for example, a couple of years ago, um, uh, presentations uh, and, and and talks about uh, how open source projects change license, like for example MongoDB, which was, as I understand, also a reaction to cloud companies uh, basically um, using it and not contributing uh, sufficient resources back um, from the perspective of the developers. And um, yeah, po points uh, like that. And so so. Uh, uh, for example, of course, there's not just the topic of licenses, they are like topics of patents and so on. And they're like, you you can't accept, uh, you can't expect to solve everything with a license. Yeah, whatever well, thing. That yeah, that's, that's yeah, the right tool for the job. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Well, I, I do think there's a, what, what's, what we're dancing around, and it's, it is where uh, a number of these things have come from, and it's sort of alluded to in the, the opening keynote today, um, there is a separate motivation here to the one that the Free Software Foundation and the Open Source Initiative uh, were built to address. And I think it's appropriate and desirable that, that OSI in particular uh, engage with this because it does affect the sort of where we're going, which is the question you asked, but tougher for the Free Software Foundation because of the, the particular commitments they've made. It's that while free software was about protecting, about addressing a specific imbalance that arises between developers and users. And that because you, you have one developer and many users, uh, you, you get a, a severe power imbalance very quickly and it gets abused all over the place. 
Um, okay, we've solved that problem because now open source is so widespread that although the, the freedoms that MSF uh, is interested in aren't perfectly implemented, it is certainly the case that abusive vendor lock-in is a much less prevalent phenomenon than, than it was historically. Give or take uh, some of Apple's behavior with respect to uh, what's happening on its, on its, both on its app store with like, you know, we want 30% of your revenue no matter what you are, or you can't sell here, uh, but also things like controlling uh, what sorts of mechanisms users can use to participate in contract tracing support for COVID. Uh, that, that's a fairly, I, I, I'm not objecting to what they, why, the, that they've made the decision. There's, there are inside forces where they can't avoid this, but I'm concerned about the fact that the, uh, the power imbalance that's created is causing an injustice. It's, it's saying that because of the problems that, that Apple has in its home country, you know, literally billions of human beings can't participate in effective contract tracing. So this is a really quite serious problem. The OSI is, oh, let, let, let me finish the thought very, very quickly. Uh, FSF is dealing with the, the power imbalance between uh, developers and users, and that power imbalance is still visible today. OSI was dealing with a collaboration, what we now call a collaboration problem, which was basically that free and open source was very, or free software was not digestible to corporates at the time. What we're now dealing with and not dealing with very well is the same thing we're seeing in uh, millennials going to work and sort of turning their nose up at working on stuff that doesn't improve the world. There's a, there is a thing to fix here. I don't yet know how to fix it. I strongly support the objectives and that's why I advocate remaining open to change and remaining engaged, but I, I don't know what the solution is. I think that, but yes, the idea that communities that are jointly operating, developing common software should be structuring themselves in a way that explicitly improves the world, I think is one that is worth pursuing somehow. Uh, Jamie, I take your point I, on arm traders and preposterous. I was trying, I worked very hard to, to focus my comments on the conduct, not the, the people, but you're quite right. If you add all that language together, um, it starts with a little bit ad hominem. I will uh, fine tune that in, in <laughs> further communication. Certainly I'm concerned about the conduct more than I am about the people. Uh, Jeff, uh, if it was possible to make large companies legal teams go on record about uh, ethical decisions, then this has value, but it's not possible. For the reasons that I've argued, if you try to use open source licensing as a means to control people, particularly to control large organizations, their response will not be to submit. Their response will be to divert their use and their implementation resources to other projects. So it's, can we make, can we build systems that encourage that? Yes, but but the moment we try to to compel or enforce or, insta or establish uh, performance standards, I, we've shot ourselves in the foot because the, the big guys, the guys we're seeking to control, the, the human rights abusing states and the um, somewhat unethical large corporates, they just will ignore us. It's not it's not a reasonable cause and effect relationship. I think I should probably stop there, given that we're over time. <laughs>